well, well, Lazarus, the secret life of Mother Mary with the Marguerite Mary Riglioso. Rigoglioso, I keep doing that. I take that name sometimes into my dream state and try to get it right. It blows <laughs> off the tongue. And of course, the uh, extraordinary William Henry, um, joined by these two extraordinary scholars. Um, in the first instance, award-winning author Marguerite Mary Rigoglioso, PhD, and the very brilliant William Henry, renowned investigative mythologist, author, and expert in sacred art and the mechanics of ascension, my favorite subject. And together, they present a groundbreaking perspective on Mother Mary beyond her role as Jesus's mother. They unveil her as a revered priestess, enlightened spiritual leader, and adept practitioner whose impact transcends conventional beliefs. Now, in her groundbreaking uh, book, The Secret Life of Mary, of Mother Mary, Divine Feminine Power for Personal Healing and Planetary Awakening, uh, Rigoglioso reveals the secret life of Mother Mary as a community leader, miracle worker, and spiritual practitioner. And she shows how nurturing a relationship with the world's most famous uh, holy um, female icon can provide healing, empowerment, and the development of our own spiritual capabilities. So, um, Marguerite and William, very, very happy uh, that you've joined us on Lazarus today. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Sasha, for having me. Thank you, you for having us. Yes. Well, you know, this is such a such an important subject. And, you know, I, I last night I'm doing this tour in the UK at the moment. And uh, last night um, I, I was on stage for over four hours uh, doing my keynote. And um, the audience, to their credit, were pretty much wrapped and didn't stone me, uh, despite it being over four hours long. Uh, but much of the substance of the my talk was keyed into feedback, Q&A, as you do with an audience. And the subject of the Eternal Mother and the need for the resurrection of the Eternal Mother is really the seminal um, emergent theme that I am seeing. I see it. Resurrection of the Ancestral Blood Song, I'm seeing that as being a seminal piece, the need for us, especially us white skins, to absolve the crimes of our forebears, in a sense, for the imperial hegemony and the Holocaust against the black skin, brown skin, red skin, yellow skin people. So there's that bit of atonement or absolution that we need to reckon with, you know, psycho-civilizationally. But more important than that resurrection of the ancestral blood song is this theme of the resurrection of the eternal mother. So what's that about? You guys are, in a sense, the alpha and omega point of that seminal emergent um, narrative. And that's the reason I'm very, very excited uh, to have this particular conversation with you both. I'll start um, on Mother Mary's active role and, and powers, and Margarita. In, in, in your book, you reveal that Mother Mary was a teacher to her community and to Jesus Christ himself. So can you just elaborate on this um, active role that she took throughout the course of her life? Yes. So, you know, Sasha, where you find this is in some of the apocryphal gospels, like um, the, the Gospel of Bartholomew, and also some of her biographies, things that were written based on probably lost material, like the life of the Virgin, which has been attributed to Maximus and so forth. So I'm not just um, pulling this out of thin air, but I will say that added to that is the source known as this, the Holy Saint, Sri Kaleshwar, who left his body in 2012, but left us with a mass of information from ancient palm leaf manuscripts attesting to all of this, as well as his past life memory, that she was Jesus, um, not only creator with the great mother, um, but as you're saying, his teacher, his primary teacher, and the primary go-to that he would reflect on and pray to before he did any of his acts or healings and so forth. So that was a number one. And then following on that, she really was the first leader of what we would call the Christian enterprise, although, you know, at that time it wasn't identified as such. And that meant she was the teacher to Mary Magdalene. She was the mentor and mother-in-law of Mary Magdalene. Um, she was the teacher of Peter. She was the head, you know, and, and Peter was the head of the men and Mary Magdalene was the head of the women. And they 
Peter butted heads with Mary Magdalene, but he was very, very respectful of Mother Mary. So she was the umbrella. She was that skirt, you know, that we've seen in those those paintings uh, where everyone's held underneath. And all of these people, these acolytes, these apostles would go out throughout the year and then they would come back to her at Easter time, tell her their troubles, tell her their successes, you know, chat it over with her and then go back out. So that's just a little snippet um, of what Mother Mary was up to in the time, you know, before, during, and after the crucifixion and resurrection. Right. So you also mentioned that she had other powers such as healing and performing exorcisms and so on. So why don't we hear more about um, yeah. these aspects of, of her life? Yeah, yeah. And as we're as we're filming this, this book is just about to come out on July 16, 2024, in which all these details are available, The Secret Life of Mother Mary. But yes, yeah, she was an extraordinary healer. She could heal illnesses, she could do depossessions of negative spirits, and she also knew how to bring people back to life, which was exemplified by what happened with Jesus. And according to Sri Kaleshwar, it was through her womb powers and these yogas that she knew how to do, the Atma Kandana Yoga and the Parakaya Pravesh, and using these mantras that she was able to resurrect Jesus. And Kaleshwar thinks that he, he resurrected in body, you know, and then went to India. Um, that's not an unheard of idea. <laughs> There's even controversy in the New Testament and so forth about whether Jesus actually died or whether he was walking around. <laughs> Um, so we have numerous stories of her doing these kinds of healings, even up to the point of her death and during her ascension process where everybody was around her bed and she had these capacities to work at a distance. There are all these testimonies to who she saved, practically sailors drowning at sea, you know, um, and it, it sounds like made up tripe until you think and realize that, well, this is how the lamas and the monks and you know those who made their ascension are described as well. So when you start seeing her from that lens and in that context, you realize, oh my gosh, this was a great holy person. And I'll conclude this by saying that Sri Kaleshwar held that she was not only the greatest holy woman, but she was the greatest holy master bar none ever to have walked the planet. And that includes her son, Jesus, because again, he was under her cloak, right? And um, was part of her creation. Wow, amazing. So um, William, based on your extensive uh, researches into ascension and, and sacred art, how do you interpret Mother Mary's role in the spiritual practice of her time? Well, one thing I would certainly add is that she was also a miraphore, uh, a mistress of the oils, a master of plant medicine, of resurrection oils, recipes which are still found on the walls of the temples in Egypt. So she's a, a master of all of the yogic techniques that Marguerite is referencing. But in addition, I think it's important to, to bring in that piece that she's a mirror for mistress of the oils. And among a troop of, of individuals, men and women, that were also masters of sacred oils and plant medicine. I think it's important that when you think about Mother Mary, there, we're told in the Gospel of Philip, there were three who always walked with the Lord. And that would be the Mother Mary, Ma Mary Salome, and Mary Magdalene, who's described as Jesus's companion. When you think about that, it sounds like, oh yeah, sure, they walked around Jerusalem, they, they, you know, they were hippies up in the Galilee together, and all this kind of thing. But then when you look at that statement, they walked with the Lord, there's only two other references to walking with the Lord in the, in the Bible, and that's in, they're both in the Old Testament. One refers to Enoch, the book of Genesis says God took him and Enoch walked with the Lord. The other was Noah. And in both instances, there's no question among academics that what that means is that they ascended. And so when you, when you think about that, we don't usually think of Mary as an ascended being. She is the first Christian to ascend, obviously after her son. And she paves the way then also in Christian art. Uh, when you see images of Mary ascending and uh, when she's offering her girdle to Thomas, for example, these are hopeful images of our own one day resurrection and ascension. The imagery that I started to really lock onto was um, 
The images of Mary in her ascension, where she looks exactly like, say, Yeshi Shogyal in the Tibetan rainbow light body tradition or Padmasambhava, and came to recognize that, hey, it looks like, and I think it was, we make a very good case that, that Mary, the Mother Mary is a rainbow light body being. She's one of these gurus that can dissolve her physical flesh and blood body into its divine essence, project herself to any location in space time she wishes to, and then phase back into a physical flesh and blood body. This are, these are what we call apparitions. And in fact, it was my journeys to Lourdes beginning in the early 2000s that started me thinking about this idea that, that Mary, as this rainbow light body guru, was in fact infusing the waters of, of Earth with these, these light body frequencies and codes. I mean, millions of people go to Lourdes every year to, uh, to bathe in the sacred waters in hopes of feeling their physical flesh and blood body. But it makes sense equally that she also infused the waters to amplify or to, to tune up our light body as well. And so when we think of, start to think about Mary as this ascended being, there's not only the textual references that support this, there's also the artistic tradition. And in my opinion, the artistic tradition is equally as important to the written word, maybe even more so because these images tend to be infused with intention and connection. They're literally icons or sacred mirrors that help us to have eye-to-eye, -eye, soul-to-soul communication with Mary and, and other avatars. So let's talk about the sequestration of the true gnosis. Let's talk about the subversion of the, of the, of the true gospel. Let's talk about uh, the eclipsing of the divine a feminine, so to speak. I refer to that whole um, element as the as the eternal mother, because it's crystal clear that this is a um, is a the ground of our existence issues through the the womb, through the waters. I mean, in this watery planet. You know, I was saying in my uh, on my tour, I tell one anecdote, and I'll just speak to it momentarily here to both of you because I think it's very interesting and very telling but 20 over 20 years ago I commissioned a um a study from the individual that I was told at the time was the leading anthropologist linguist I could find an extraordinary a professor uh, Dr. Dejo Benedict in uh, UGA Atlanta United States uh, in Georgia and I flew to meet with him and I spoke, guy spoke 26, 27 languages. Insane, crazy genius. And um, I met with him in, in the university, in, in, in the faculty. And I said to him, I'd like to commission a study. Um, I'd like to define how many tribes or first nations exist on the surface of the earth. Simple. Thinking um, it might be, um, it might be a hundred, you know, maybe, you know, a couple of hundred, maybe. And um, he said, okay, what are the criteria? And I said, um, a different tongue, a different God, and a different song and dance. A year later, I was called back, and I flew back to Atlanta. And I remember walking across the, um, the campus with the professor uh, to this huge gymnasium room. And on the way, him stopping and speaking about nine different lang languages to different students, a very popular uh, professor, much beloved by the student body. And um, we walked into this gymnasium room and there were thousands of papers all around the wall. The whole thing was literally wallpapered with full scap, short uh, print. And he said, there's your study. He said, we've stopped um, because it's so nebulous and it continues. Uh, we've hit over 10,000. Oh, and I wow. said, oh, dear God. I said, so So he said, change the format. What are you looking for? What do you want to learn from this? Um, I said, actually, for me, I want to understand inception point, genesis point. So therefore, what is the common creation myth of all of these thousands of tribes that you and the student body have researched over the last year for this for this commission. And he said, that I can tell you right now. And he said, put your seatbelt on. He said, the common creation myth that we've discovered is that at the center of our field of reality, which is commonly regarded as the spiral galaxy, 
is a spiral leading to a black hole. And in the middle of that black hole is a grandmother spider weaving her magic. Mm -hmm. And that's the common myth touchstone of all the tribal nations on the face of the earth. Now, I've still got that, that extraordinary study, but it's never been published in the open. But I'm curious, what do you think of that, William? Grandmother Spider weaving her magic, and that's the common touchstone of all the primal and Aboriginal peoples uh, that, we, that we have any record of in the world. Yeah, I think I, it's beautiful. I mean, of course, it reminds me instantly of the Hopi legend of the grandmother spider as well. And it goes to this idea of these, these cosmic mothers as being weavers. And the words like matrix comes from mother, nature, nurture, all come out of the same sort of root and the concept of Tantra, of course, weaving the cosmic energies. And so it seems that in the, what these stories are actually weaving for us is a, is a way to connect with the mother, the way to connect with the universe, to become master weavers ourselves. Indeed. Uh, Ma Marguerite, your, your thoughts yes, on that. Absolutely, let's, talk about, absolutely. let's talk about the sequestration and the, uh, yeah, the subterfuge. All right. Well, I'll get into that. Just commenting on this weaving theme, you know, in the previous book that you and I talked about, uh, Sasha, the mystery tradition of miraculous conception, where I really lay it out in very readable form, what Mother Mary was up to for this conception of Jesus. What was she doing at the time of conceiving Jesus? Weaving. Right. So as William is saying, this motif is very, very strong. And I think it has to do with a cosmic kind of technology or weaving of, you know, however the physics of the feminine universe is created. But it also has to do with the gradations down into the dimensions onto the earth plane right. of how this is all possible. But Mother Mary was still accessing that higher method of conception that was a, considered a kind of a cosmic or quantum weaving, if you will, when she was creating or co-creating or pulling through Jesus, right? So it's all in correspondence. So I'll I'll pause there and I can address your other question if you'd like, but I'll- Well, I'll indeed. Do. So let, let's just look, enter the patriarch, okay? So let, let's look at that. I yeah. mean, I know that when we look out onto this, um, through the visible spectrum of light into this 3D temporal plane. And I've traveled to upward of 30 countries in the last 18 months or so, constantly flying, constantly landing, constantly darting in and out of cities and what have you. And I know that one thing that greets me everywhere is the penis, is the phallus, is the obelisk, is the spire. is the, uh, So this is a, a thematic that just courses through this, this planet. And, um, you know, the pyramids and all of these kind of phallic symbols. But that aside, that aside, um, which, of course, is the citadel, which, of course, is what what robbed us of our humanity and drew us toward the false light, took us off the lateral plane of existence as the sons and daughters of God, the living men and women of the living soil. And over millennia, we were called and pulled and drawn to the false light of the citadel. And cities, kill grids have emerged now, these Babylonian constructs of helter-skelter, where I fly over millions of, uh, you know, square kilometers of land constantly, and I'm looking down and seeing an empty planet. Yeah. And yet we're told that there's too many of us, and there's nowhere for us to thrive on the surface of the earth. Nothing could be further from the truth. Endless plains, endless forests, endless mountains, endless hills and beaches so that movement away from the lateral into the to the vertical i'm trying to speak about that archetypal language of how we were pulled away from innocence pulled toward the false light into this babylonian edifice and that emerges and the patriarchy entered the entire psycho civilizational complex gets pulled into this and it gets worse than that you know, the, the, these men wearing frocks and red booties ending up the colleges of cardinals and things like that end up becoming the greatest enclaves of temporal power and dominion known to man since pre-diluvial times. What gives? It's all about men, males. And actually, it goes into sodomy. It goes into the perverse, the inverse kundalini, the perversification of the male even. So speak, if you will, to that 
uh, thematic, that was psycho-civilizational thematic, that perversity. And where's the Magdalene in that? What took down that primary archetypal element in our psycho-civilizational model? And how do we reclaim it? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, I have been going back to my oracle information and then looking into what's in the Gnostic material as verification. And what you find there is that Jesus and Magdalene and the whole sacred Sophia Christos family came precisely because of this sexualized issue. That's what you find. And that's what I've been teaching. There's nothing wrong with the phallus. There's nothing wrong with the womb. It's how they get used, misused, disappeared, and so forth by beings that don't really have to do with humanity. So that goes way back into lots of these ancient stories. This is about off-planet interference into the earth doings. Um, there's been positive creation here. There's been negative distortion here. And somehow the negative distortion aspect of it really dug in and decided that it was going to disappear, rape, and technologize the womb and exonerate the phallus and make it the focal point for putting in all of these negative energies into that gridding system that you see when you see those obelisks and so forth all yeah. over. So, you know, it 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 kind of goes back to this off-planet um issue. And that is why Magdalene Jesus, uh, you know, Mother Mary and all of them came to the earth at that time in the in the horrific Roman Empire, where it was really digging in. And they continued to dig in, creating the whole complex of a church that shall remain unnamed, um, that really had very little to do with these esoteric beings, these masters. And um, so now they're having this second and third and fourth and fifth coming back through this these kinds of revelations that that we're all doing together. And through our inner work of coming back into our unity, our, our Sophianic Christos unity, right? To just throw off the shackles of all of this. So that's kind of my short story uh, about what's going on. Very good. And William, will you speak to this as well? Yeah, I think uh, one thing I might add is that historically, at least in the recent timeline, the patriarchy, as I understand it, was really introduced around 650, 686 BC by King Josiah. Prior to that, the Israelites were worshiping uh, a dual God, a male female God, God in, in Isis. It was Yahweh and Isis, Yahweh and Hathor, Yahweh and Ishtar, the, the sacred marriage. And this is what the imagery portrayed inside the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple. But then after time, it goes into disuse. And then King Josiah is the one who introduces the Ten Commandments. He, he comes up with this book called Deuteronomy and starts speaking about this soul male God and these this new law that, that Moses had introduced. And as he installed that, that's when God got a divorce. This is when the Old Testament God Yahweh no longer has his consort, his feminine counterpart, who in fact is probably even more, quote unquote, powerful than than Yahweh. This is when the Temple of Solomon is sanitized of all the images of the divine feminine, the Nehushtan, all of the imagery of the Garden of Eden, of this paradisical realm. God not only gets a divorce, but he they kick the they kick the bitch out of the temple. I and mean, that's from their point of view. It's time to get rid of the divine feminine. And what happened with that were two really important things. One, it was no longer allowed to talk about ascension. And secondly, even Josiah forbade that we looked into the stars, lest we connect with the heavenly hosts. So this sets up a, a scenario, and this is just at the same time as the, the Babylonian captivity, when the Jews are taken by Nebuchadnezzar into Babylon, and many of the mystic-minded Jews reconnect with the Babylonian mystics, who understood ascension and understood these practices and still spoke the same languages, or saying ascension language that the, the Israelites spoke. And then after this captivity, this is when they come back to Jerusalem and it's like, hey, you know, where's all our stuff? Where's the divine feminine? Where's where's Isis? Where's Hathor? Where's her, her Ark of the Covenant? They bring back a portion of the Ark of the Covenant and the, the mystic minded Jews knew this was all fake. It's all just basically trickery that there's been a changing of the gods and they hold this grudge for 400 years. And this is then when the Essenes come on the scene and decide, 
It's time now to call in a high celestial being, as the Dead Sea Scrolls say, that will help us put on our crown of glory in our robe of unending light. And for 10 years, I would have and had made the argument that I believe what the Dead Sea Scrolls were talking about was the calling in of, of Yeshua as this high celestial being. But then after reading Marguerite's work, I start to flip and think, well, wait a minute, maybe it was actually Mary who was that high celestial being. Because mm. she not only manifests the Christ, but she also, in her own way, demonstrates the crown of glory and the robe of un unending light. So that's kind of the historical picture, as I understand it, of what happened with this changing of the gods and the removal of the, the, the divine feminine from the temple. And then this uh, effort, especially on the behalf of the, the Essenes, to change this, to to bring back the 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 male female unity in the in the story of Jesus and, and Magdala. Fascinating, fascinating. So Margarita uh, discuss the relationship will, uh, between uh, Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene and why why that story's been repressed. Yeah, you know, when I started going deeply into the research of this uh, book about Mother Mary, I then came upon these documents about their relationship and it really got me thinking, you know, from my higher mind, like, okay, what, what were they? What was this all about? How would they have interacted? Like, I had really never had that thought before, even though I had read what William had read that three always walked with the Lord, you know, Mother Mary, her sister and Mary Magdalene. And um, so I just started looking at interiorly, what would they have been doing together? And then I find that that they were carrying the myrrh. They mm. were, you know, Mother Mary was was working with Mary Magdalene in using the myrrh for enlightenment, for people to go into these altered states of consciousness, for um, anointing the dead so that they could have better passages and so forth. Um, and Mother Mary was was in some senses what we see in these in these sources is that she was Magdalene's teacher. She was the one who basically helped initiate her um, into her rightful role as the head of the women. That wasn't like an automatic thing, just like it wasn't automatic with Peter. So, and then I've, I've contemplated how, well, they must have really been able to get along, you know, in three-dimensional, <laughs> in three-dimensional human relating they were always walking with the Lord. They must have um, talked, you know, together so much. And if Mary Magdalene did engage as, as a partner or a spouse with Jesus, then clearly Mother Mary would have been her mother-in-law. You know, there would have been these kinds of dialogues and this kind of relating. And how I see it is, okay, these are two highly elevated beings. So they would offer the template for sisterhood, healthy sisterhood, healthy mother-in-law, daughter-in-law hood, right? Um, mm -hmm. Healthy mentor, mentee uh, relations, all of that kind of thing. And um, I think this is worth all of us going into our own Oracle states uh, to, to tease out from the Akashic records what would have been happening, what would have been transpiring between the two of them for the instruction and the healing that it could offer us in our human relating today. Interesting. So I, I, I've seen some compelling um, etym etymological um, um, evidences, I guess, that the that the name or the moniker Jesus is a, is a, is a symbiosis between Zeus and Krishna. Uh, it's, it's compelling to look at that. Um, what is the etymology of, of the name Mary, as you understand it? Yeah, very interesting. How I see it is I, I go by the work of D.M. Murdoch in her book, Christ in Egypt. And she traces this scholarship that says that really that word comes from Mary, how this term was transliterated in the ancient Egyptian, M-E-R-I, and what it refer it was an honorific associated with Isis. And what it essentially means is the one who is love, the one who loves, and the one who is loved. So lover, beloved, and love itself. That is the name Mary. It's it means divine love. 
and it would have gotten translated into Mariam or Miriam and then Maria and then Mary. How we have it today is interestingly the closest to that Egyptian. And this would have been used as a title to uh, designate holy political leaders and so forth. So it would be like Mary, um, you know, Akhenaten, not, it's not the same time period, but it, but there, it would be a title for these people. And then really it became a priestess title, meaning a sacred woman of divine love and womb mysteries, mm -hmm. because all of these women actually were not only working with the heart, but they were working with the, the prema, the love that is part of the womb and all of that magic. So that's, that's what I um, have come to. And I, I just loved that discovery of that information because it's so empowering for us today. Yeah. Right. One thing I might add, if I could, Sasha and, and Marguerite, is that uh, I.E.S. Edwards was one of the great Egypt Egyptologists from Britain. And he was the first that dug out that the pyramids were originally called Mer, M-E-R. And of course, Egypt was also called Mer, beloved land. And Mer, when applied to the pyramid, meant specifically instrument or place of ascension. So mm -hmm. that, I think that's an important thread to pull into this because that ultimately is the work of, of the mares and, and the Marys. And in ancient Egypt, these priestesses were ascension priestesses. And as Marguerite goes into great detail in her book, she, she draws that mare lineage back to Egypt, back to the goddess Net, all the way back to the very beginning, this, this goddess who auto-generates and starts creating these gynecological schools in Egypt, the Temple of uh, Sais, where the story of Atlantis was preserved and saved during the time of the flood, was a temple dedicated to the goddess Net. And she's part of this, this lineage that then runs through all of the Egyptian ascension teachings. And ultimately, then it reformulates within Christianity. And of course, we, we get then the, the Yeshua story and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Indeed. And of course, mare in French is also sea, ocean, sea. Very exactly. interesting. Yeah. So 431 AD was the invention of the cult of the Virgin. So that, that was when the, the, um, the priesthood, so to speak, the, the burgeoning Roman Catholic Church, you know, nigh on a century after the Council of Nicaea, um, literally imposed and invented the cult of the virgin 431 ad and then in, in fi uh, 594 ad um purgatory was invented in 610 ad the title of pope was invented um again this is all speaks to the page the emergent patriarchy celibacy was imposed uh, on the priesthood in um shortly after um uh, 1066 doomsday or 1079 um, uh, AD, and then in, in 1184, um, the Inquisition underway, and the indulgences started being sold shortly after that in 1190s, about six six years later. Um, confessions were imposed in 1215 AD, um, and the Immaculate Conception was again invented and installed um, in 1854 AD, I don't know where it, the derivative was, but and in 1870 AD, um, the infallibility of the Pope was declared again, invented, just yeah. just like that. <laughs> yeah. So, and that that really for me, it, this that timeline describes how this 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 patri patriarchy just ran a straight line um, through the undulation of our holographic reality of our beautiful um, typhonic um, realm of limitless quantum creativity mm -hmm. and everything was sequestered into this um, this kind of iron rod um, but it's curious isn't it that this is all led again by males and by by male think and one wonders where did that perversity enter how and what was it that permissioned or permitted that per per perversity to enter? Either of you. Well, the perversity was already going on mm -hmm. for thousands of years. Yeah. And that is why you have these returning masters, be they male or female, to try to come and help the human race and throw off this interference. Um, 
but the perversity can get more intensified when they do things like create obelisk, uh, you know, places on earth where they're, they're inserting certain powers and they can control the yeah. portals and things like that through the artificial, um, the artificial buildings and, and construction that they do as well as whatever other magic they're doing behind the scenes, all while telling us there's no such thing as magic yet using it to, you, you know, wreak all of this havoc. So this perversity and this distortion and this, um, patriarchy, if you will, you know, in the archaeological uh, record, you can see it going back to 3000 BCE, because I've studied this extensively. You see the changeover from the artifacts that show veneration of the Great Mother into this other use of metals, these images of war. It starts at about 3000 BCE, most places in the world. So that's like some kind of traumatic event that happened. I mean, I again, I do think it's an interdimensional thing that wends its way into the human family and keeps it in there through these um, distorted birthing programs that have been going on in one way or another. So, you know, and I just wanted to speak to two of the things you said on that timeline. You know, the virgin, the creation of the cult of the virgin, um, there are some ways in which the reality and the truth can poke through even these most strange or dastardly of dogmas that are right. created. And this is one of them where they are speaking to virginity is really the sovereignty of the female and the ability to uh, conceive in a parthenogenetic way to self-conceive through that interweaving process, right? A very high level priestess function that mimics the way that humans used to be able to reproduce because we were hermaphroditic originally, okay? With the splitting of the humans, that was a big problem, okay? And so the other thing I wanna mention is that um, the Immaculate Conception Doctrine, most people think it's the doctrine of Mary giving birth to Jesus in virgin fashion. No, the actual doctrine is that Mother Mary was born free of sin. That's the Immaculate Conception. So what I see in all this research that I've done is that this is speaking to the fact that actually the reason why we would consider Mother Mary as being born without sin is because of the manner in which she was conceived by her mother, which was parthenogenetically, which is written in, in these ancient documents. So Mother Mary was already a high level avatar. She was of several vibrations above the normal human. She probably was able to uh, release or supersede karma and you know negative behavior and, and that kind of thing. Um, and then she was able to give divine birth through her womb yogas to Jesus. But, but immaculate conception is this somewhat distorted, but underneath there's a hidden truth about Mother Mary that it's very interesting to look at, I think. Very good. So yeah. William, sorry, speak okay. to that. Speak yeah, I was just going to say one comment on the Immaculate Conception Doctrine as well. I've just come back from Lourdes, and of course many know that, that this is where there were apparitions of the Mother Mary to a young girl named Bernadette Subaru. She appeared to her over 16 times, and at first Bernadette simply called her the white thing. She had no idea what she was dealing with. It was just this apparition of a what appears to be like a plasma being, and that's how she's portrayed in paintings. And then it was when Mary identified herself as the Immaculate Conception that the, the local bishop began to really pay serious attention that something was going on here, because there's no way this illiterate, illiterate peasant girl, Bernadette Subaru, could have any idea of this complicated conception of the, the Immaculate Conception doctrine that was just recently installed, as you pointed out. Right. So moving into more edifying um subject matter. William, considering your work on, on star myths and their connection to human transformation, how do you view um, Mother Mary's link to the star realms, particularly the Pleiades? Well, I mean, that's such a fun question. And as I mentioned previously, I had spent a, over a decade or so looking at the Mother Mary as a rainbow light body being and having this ability to again, dissolve her body into light, project it to another world and phase back into physicality, a la the guru Padmasambhava or Yashisogi also. That, I was really comfortable with that whole idea. 
And then in January of this year, Marguerite's book, just kind of the heavens open, and uh, it, her book on miraculous conception drops out of the sky. And here she's talking about Mary as an exemplar of Parthenogenesis and tracing the history of Parthenogenesis back to the Hathors, the seven Hathors in the Egyptian tradition, and their direct link mythologically to the Pleiades. And so here comes this kind of conception in my mind where, wait a minute, Marguerite is really clearly saying there's a link with Mary and the Pleiades. And what's going through my mind is, yeah, I get that. And I, I think I see how she got here to begin with. She didn't travel from the Pleiades to Earth in a spaceship or a generation starship. She used the most elegant method of, tra of uh, traveling the cosmos. She utilized the technology of a physical flesh and blood human body, especially a female one, which Padmasambhava always insists was the superior model for enlightenment. And I just started to develop this, this conception that, well, what if? Mary was part of a tribe of priestesses on some planet in the Pleiades. There's hundreds of stars in the Pleiades. We think of it as a constellation with seven stars, but there's actually hundreds and potentially hundreds of inhabited worlds. But what if she's a priestess there and they, they somehow get this inspiration to go do missionary work on this outback planet um, nearby um, on the very edge of the Milky Way galaxy. And so they make a commitment to coming to earth. And then as Marguerite establishes in her works, they then through, they appear autogenically, then they, in a sense, clone themselves through parthenogenesis, creating a female copy. And then they start to in introduce male avatars into the line, all with the, uh, the ultimate goal of upgrading humanity. And it just all came together in my mind as this very plausible scenario of how an avatar could travel from the Pleiades and come here and ultimately leave this teaching behind for all of us to now put together at this crucial moment in history. And the, the traveling you're speaking to is the activation of Merkaba. They were Merkaba mystics, Magdalene, Mother Mary. It's very clear they are Merkaba mystics, not Drumbelow Merkaba. That's a whole different kettle of fish. That's his own perception. When I'm talking Merkaba metaphys metaphysics, I'm talking straight up Jewish mystical metaphysical cart of God, cab of God uh, transformation into a light being. It has nothing to do with the star tetrahedron. And I'm just not being mean there. I'm just pointing this out historically and factually that when the Mother Mary would have been teaching Merkaba mysticism or Magdalene taught Merkaba mysticism as she did at the synagogue in the Galilee at Magdala, evidenced by the, the Magdala stone, they are talking about literal light body transfiguration. That is their ultimate aim. That is That is what their teaching was about. And that is, in my view, what their, their priestesshood was ultimately dedicated to. Fascinating. So you've spoken, about, uh, William, you, you've spoken about the significance of sacred symbols and iconography. Um, and again, just to underscore, how is Mother Mary represented in sacred art? And what does this tell us about her divine nature? And when you see the Mother Mary portrayed in art, she looks exactly like Isis. She's wearing a transparent linen garment with a blue belt typically a blue belt, sometimes a, a red belt tied with the knot of Isis. And what this does artistically is it establishes this lineage. You can put an A to B comparison of Isis on the, the temple walls or ne Nefertari or Mary Nefertari, as she was actually referred to as in her tomb in the Valley of the Queens. They are attired identically. And what the transparent linen garment symbolizes is their ability to phase into the light body, to to dematerialize their physical flesh and blood body into a light body form and then travel interdimensionally and, as I mentioned, phase back into physicality. Very sometimes good. sometimes Mary has 12 stars on her head, which is really a fascinating attribute. If I can just take one moment, because, and the reason why it's so inter interesting to me is there's no good definition of why she's portrayed with these 12, 12 stars. Are they the 12 constellations? Are they the 12 apostles? What do they represent? Well, fascinatingly, in the Tibetan rainbow light body tradition, they tell us that this resurrection teaching, this ascension teaching, the rainbow light body, is taught in 13 star systems, including our own. So what if Mary is a representative of this federation of star systems that are all about or dedicated to advancing this rainbow light body teaching? And this is why she is the star, the star of the sea, as she's called, 
with 12 stars on her halo. 12 meaning plus, to, meaning to say, meaning to say she's the 13th. She's the 13th star, correct. Right. And and that's that's a seminal piece that when we talk about our misapprehensions about the astrological houses and the and, and the number 12, 13, mm -hmm. of course, being subverted also as a number and flipped into being um, wrongly um, thought of as an unlucky, unlucky number. Again, right. taking attention away from the 13th house. I mean, all and that's where the subterfuge also creeps back in. Mm -hmm. So um, what are the historical meanings of the words, I guess this is for you, Margarita, Mary and Virgin, and how can we work with these words as mantras for healing and empowerment today? Yeah, well, you know, I love to do this process with people where I do versions of Mary as and Mariam as a kind of a mantra as Mary I am, Mary I am, uh, Mar I am, Mare I am, you know, I, I take people through this. And in fact, I have this, um, people can get these meditations associated with the book. And, and one of them is that, that using of the Mary as a mantra for people to get into this open state and really be incorporating these codes uh, that are associated with the Mary concept term, the, the love concept. Um, so, that's, you know, it's it's very beautiful when you start thinking about it. And in a way, like, again, the, the church that shall remain unnamed um, kind of started getting at this with the Hail Mary prayer, right? Like a lot of people use that Hail Mary prayer as a means of, of as a mantra, as a means of getting into an altered state and opening up to the grace and, and wisdom and love of Mother Mary and the healing. Um. So, but um, about virgin, this is a very important term. And as I alluded to before, really the ultimate original meaning of it was sovereign, okay? And, and whole and hermaphroditic and androgynous, like literally physically and certainly energetically being one with the masculine feminine elements woven, perfectly woven together, which will then pop you into another dimension of being, okay? So this weaving that these women were doing were not only to create um, avatars from their wombs, it was an inner process to really advance themselves. And it's a process for us to do as well. And it's also something that we know of through the Gnostic sacrament of the bridal chamber and so forth. But this, this virgin idea um, came to be associated with celibacy at times because some of these women would not need to engage in sexual relations because they were already whole and complete. They, were, they had already reestablished their androgynous nature. So they didn't really need that energetically, physically, what have you. Um, and then some of the women, so, you know, because when you do engage with another person, you bring in their karma, their energy and, and all that kind of thing. So what I know going back into the ancient Greek tradition and, and well earlier than that, is that a lot of these virgin birth priestesses had to remain celibate so that they didn't um, bring in other lines of energy and, and other you know, troubles and so forth and so on. So they were continually working on this inner sovereignty. And that's where I think we're wanting to go today is, is into this inner bridal chamber because that's what everyone is seeking. It ultimately pops you in unification with source creator. That's what we're all wanting, right? And that's the lived experience of ascension on earth. Yeah, that I makes complete, that makes complete sense to my mind. I mean, if, if 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 to be crass about it, if the we can describe this um, patriarchal kind of hegemony um, as a kind of rape culture, because that's essentially what it comes down to. It's, yes, a, it's a rape culture. Whether you're talking about the rape of women, uh, meaning to say being bullied and butchered by uh, by um, by deviant 
masculine or incoherent masculinity, uh, civilizationally, culturally, generationally. You're also talking about the rape of the womb of Gaia um, in terms of exploiting the resources of the the earth, you know, bringing up oil and gas from and the plasma of the earth from the womb of the earth and rupturing it and, you know, fracking and blowing things up, exploding it, turning it into hot electricity, sending that into the cities to poison and contaminate. You know, that's all rape of Gaia. To my mind, it's the same thing. So this well, and it goes back to the rape of the goddess. It goes back yeah. to the rape of the holy womb herself. Okay, she gave free will to her beings. And then, you know, there was a rogue angelic force that decided to twist everything around. And then all of a sudden they are raping the mother that has given them birth. And we see this encoded in, you know, Greek stories in particular. Um, but it, it, it's a whole thing that goes at every level of the hologram. And that's what we're trying to reverse. And here's another thing. What you find out in the Gnostic Gospels is that the, the original problem was not only rape, but it was pedophilia of the boys. Mm. That is in the Gnostic Gospels. Okay. So we have this dual thing going on. Um, it, the errant phallic energy that's, that's not only distorting the womb, but it's distorting the phallus itself yes. through these perpetrations upon males in the world and then like this thing gets completely out of control right yeah. so this is why the the Sophia Christos family <laughs> was here is here you know has been here in many different forms throughout all of these 10,000 plus stories you know that you've got going on and we're trying to awaken to this again and what can we do about this in our own bodies in our own emotions gain mastery and not fall prey to all of these hooks that are here to continue having us go down and down and down. And you know, the curious thing, just to go, go down that that road slightly, I, I, I study this um, very closely for a number of years, connected to wanting to understand ritual sacrifice of innocence and the work I was doing with uh, human trafficking and trying to understand what really is behind um, this generational ritual satanic abuse and and what have you. And part of that narrative, as you rightly say, uh, spoke to the um, this kind of burgeoning sodomy from ancient Greece that courses its way through our history. But look at Washington, D.C., the connection to Georgetown, you know, the the, the Vatican complex and um, the the rank uh, pedophilia slash um, emphasis um, amongst boys. Uh, young boys with the priesthood uh, in the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. The British establishment, this is well known here, I'm in London right now, the, the British establishment's connection to, you know, Jimmy Savile, BBC, you know, suppressing this rank pedophilia, courses its way through all the boarding schools here and so on. So that, that what we learned, or I learned, was that's connected to, sodomy's connected to the inversion of Kundalini. Again, it, it is a, a Saturnian slash satanic practice of subverting and inverting the kundalini of the young uh, child, emphasis the male, and then being able to draw the energy into the priest, the Babylonian priest or the dark, the, the, the black priest, and then use that power, that stolen Promethean power in the temporal realm. That's kind of the parasite energetic uh, complex that's been going on keyed into sodomy inversion of kundalini in simple terms moving back to our more gracious subject you talk about um mary mother's use of um, advanced practices uh, in the conception and resurrection of jesus so what is her catalytic role in the uh, why is her catalytic role in his resurrection not more commonly uh, known and spoken well to? i know and this was this was such a shock when I took the Holy Womb Chakra system course in 2017 and had Cindy Lindsay, who was the direct uh, student of Sri Kaleshwar, who brought this information forth from the ancient palm leaf manuscripts, as well as his past life information. Um, and it was the first time I had ever worked with cacao. <laughs> I mean, that morning, one of the women who was with us, Angela de la Agua, she said, oh, let's do a cacao ceremony. We're like, OK, you know, I didn't know that it was going to open me up. And so we're sitting there and Cindy Lindsay is saying um, that 
Mother Mary resurrected Jesus through her her womb practices, her, these mantras and these other yogas. And I was I I I was beside myself with weeping, you know, because I had also received in medicine ceremony different medicine that um that I could take ancestors back through my womb and have them go to the light like the unrestful dead. So I was already, I had already seen that the womb was a portal for both ways. And so this made sense to me when I did hear this and whether this resurrection was helping Jesus to have his ascension into the other dimensions or whether it was helping him to reconstruct his body and then go walk around India later on. Um, you know, I don't know. And I think both are fascinating and both are wonderful. And we take whichever one, whichever story has the medicine for us. But, you know, basically he says that she took him on her lap. You know, and as I discuss in the, in the secret life of Mother Mary in this whole chapter, he there is a, literally a time when she could have done this, according to her biography, after he was taken down from the cross and Nicodemus and so forth were helping with, you know, before the entombment of this body, she could have been alone with this body. Everyone else scattered to the wind. They were completely freaked out. She was literally the only one who remained, took him onto her lap, like Michelangelo shows in the Pietà. Yeah. And she began doing her mantric practices which were really more than just sound syllables, but she was working it, right? She was working these energies and he had already been working these energies on the cross himself. He had already taken most of his soul out of his body, left just a little bit in. And so they were working, they were doing this Padakaya Pravesh and this Atmakandana Yoga. And through this process, she was able to, you know, restore him either, either in soul on the other side or body and soul on the earth plane. I think that is a pretty fascinating thing because she not only gave him divine birth, but she gave him divine rebirth in whatever way we're going to see that. That is a very powerful master. And that is showing us what the power is in all of our wombs. This is not just for Mother Mary, but it's for, it's for all the other lineage priestesses who want to become Marys and Magdalens, mm -hmm. you know, which I'm going to be teaching about. Okay, yeah. so... This is not just a historical, interesting artifact, but it's where, how are we going forward? And I think something that supports that too is just the fact that Mary is a temple weaver. That's that's her occupation. And there is certainly literary evidence that suggests she's the one who wove the Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. She's also the one who, who wove the Veronica, the, the, the true icon that they call it the Vale of Montepello. It's located in Italy now. It's made of byssus, which is a very rare substance produced by a, a very rare snail that uh, only these priestesses knew how to weave this byssus material. And so in route to the cross, uh, you, you have a female offering Jesus this veil and he takes it and puts his facial imprint on it. So in, in, in accompanying with the Shroud of Turin, we have two examples of artifacts that are still in existence today that were woven by these temple priestesses that could even have been woven by the mother mary herself and on this weaving it's i think also worth noting that at least mystically speaking as a temple weaver she the mother mary is responsible for weaving the veil of solomon's temple this is the star veil that symbolized all four elements earth there fire and water that separated the holy place from the most holy place inside the temple the Mother Mary, according to tradition, is the one who wove that veil. And during the crucifixion, that is the same veil that is split in two. And this portal of light opens as a result. This is not your ordinary temple veil talking about here. It's, it's, it's almost as if it's like some kind of magic curtain, like Solomon's magic carpet. It's got this weird, wacky metaphysical implication to it, like it's some kind of technology, if you will. And as the story then continues, Christ's resurrected body literally becomes the veil. And then the Shroud of Turin becomes the veil. And of course, this is all about weaving. This going back to this, this tradition of Mary as the weaver, weaving cosmic energies, 
of as Marguerite is establishing, of, of literally putting him on her lap and through the yoga techniques, resurrecting his body in accompaniment with the oils, in accompaniment, in accompaniment with the Shroud of Turin, the Veil of Montepello, all of this is working together. And it seems as if perhaps, and you brought this up a moment ago, Sasha, it's like, why now? Why all of a sudden, why haven't we talked about Mary in these terms for the past 1900 years? Well, we just haven't, but the, the, the bits and pieces have been there. And what Marguerite has been done so brilliantly is to start to bring that together and to take Mary off the felt board as a two-dimensional character and make her a three-dimensional character. What were her conversations with Mary Magdalene? What were her intentions with Yeshua? What is her cosmic connection? You start to put all this together in a factual way, not like some influencer just grabbing you know stuff to spout anything to get attention, but from an actual academic and historic perspective, it presents an image of a, a story about Mary that is far more beautiful and even more revelatory and miraculous than anything the, the, the church has dared to, to presume to know about her. Very good. Well, just, just for the record, there's nothing wrong with being an influencer spouting anything to get attention. I'm <laughs> joking. Look, <laughs> I, I'm compelled to ask you, I'm compelled to ask you, why are you wearing Medusa on your T-shirt? <laughs> Oh, because it's uh, from the Parthenon in Nashville. Oh, yeah. Right. And we could go into that whole thing. Yeah. This is this is a divine birth priestess, actually. Yeah. This is a ah. priestess of divine conception who was raped. Okay, so that's a whole other story. Not no, no, give me the give me the give me the two minute on this. I love this. Well, you know, um, Medusa was a priestess of Athena. She's a North African priestess. So she's connected with that very deep indigenous culture there. And um, she was also a warrior. She was part of the these Amazon women who mm -hmm. developed um, to try to protect against this incursion of the patriarchy and so forth. Um, good, bad, or indifferent. I mean, <laughs> they created their own karma with that. But um, she, she was a very important head priestess warrior spirit woman and so the beheading of her by the patriarchy there's a whole story associated with that was a very grave uh transgression that has had massive ripples in our earth today mm -hmm. but medusa whose dreadlocks are uh, associated with snakes which of course is the original the original feminine wisdom energy, it's the kind of a dragon energy really, um, becomes the aegis or the protector of Athena herself, the goddess Athena. So hidden in these strange codes is a truth. You know, you have to be able to tease out this, this truth by, by looking in these alternative ways. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'm just pulling up a, an image here. Tell me if you can see it. So uh, the, the, can you see this okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is curious. This is the uh, Dahomey Amazon warrior yes. women and the only documented frontline female troops yeah. um, in, in modern warfare history. And they were the African sub-Saharan group of female terminators who left, who left the colonizers shaking in their boots. Yeah. And I use this as the last slide on my tour just to salute these extraordinary women. I and know. then of course, and then of course the image there of the, uh, of the grandmother's spider weaving her magic in the, yeah. in the center yeah. of the game. <laughs> you know, there's a whole long, I did a whole workshop earlier this year about the Amazons with uh, Indigo Angel. And mm. we really, we really dove into that. And there's uh, Maya Nartumid is another wonderful Oracle priestess who has a lot of information coming through about the origin of the Amazons going back to Atlantis and then Lemuria and the, the degeneration of what happened there when you have to start getting into physical warfare, you know, and yes, it is remarkable that the Dahomey women are a vestige of what we see in the Greek tradition and the Anatolian tradition They're, you know, but um, much, much degenerated and, and basically completely disempowered by the time it gets into Dahomey. Well, well but that's the thing. So I said earlier, resurrection of the ancestral blood song, my divinations of traveling the world for 25 years now is that that resurrection of the ancestral blood song is returning and the resurrection of the eternal mother. Those are the two central thematics that I know are happening. So I rather suspect 
that that ancestral blood song has to now before the atonement really happens and redemption and then salvation that uh, that the absolution bit is where we have to listen to the blood song each of us each of us black skin brown skin red skin yellow skin we've we've all been every color under the sun anyway mm-hmm. and it's no small secret that the uh, people suffering the most in the native american reservations and in the outback of the colonies in africa are the reinc- oftentimes the reincarnated souls of the colonizers and the conquestors yes do the redemption live through yep. that process yes to the first nation peoples and the aboriginals because i speak to them constantly so there's that piece the ancestral blood song and i rather suspect that those dahomey uh, women and that all the majesty there actually will return in some s- significant shape or form uh in the new emergent human the post mrna dna intervention human that we're going to almost certainly witness in the coming few years. In any event, whilst I've got you both here, I wanted to ask, um, William, what's the connection to your remarkable kind of historical understanding of the Hathors, the Cathars, and the Essenes? Uh, why is, whenever we speak of the, the, the Hathors, the Cathars, and the Essenes, or whenever I speak to them or hear about them, I get a good feeling. Yeah. Why? Well, because they represent ultimately the the... The light bringers. They are the the way showers of the ultimate perfection of humanity. They are they are the ones that have committed to ultimately this process of angelification of human transformation into angels. And I feel like that was the ultimate missionary work of of the Hathors was to to infuse the human genome with a a, a more advanced line, an advanced version that was capable of actually attaining ascension. And that, of course, is what the Essenes were all about, angelification, Cathars, angelification. And you can argue the same thing with the Hathors. Very good. And William, in closing, from your perspective, how can we invoke uh, Mother Mary's presence in our own spiritual practices uh, for healing and and guidance as you see it? One of the main ways uh, that I always advocate is through sacred art. And And the reason why is because as an avatar, like Yeshua, like Padmasambhava, like like others, they are able to transmit their essence or vibration through the image. The Gnostics use an expression, enter through the image, or the image will show us the way. And these are why images of of Mary are so comforting to people, be it a a statue or a painting. This is why uh, photos of apparitions are, are so powerful as well, because they, in a technological way, convey even more information. So I I just simply encourage having the presence of Mary in your sacred space, be it a statue, a painting, or even a a look up some of the apparitions. And it's like, for example, in Cairo, when 400,000 people saw the apparition of the Mother Mary, there were photographs taken. She's very clearly a plasma being and radiating this profound light. Beautiful. So, Margarita, um, how can developing a personal uh, relationship with Mother Mary provide healing and empowerment in our daily lives? It is one way that people can experience this healing that we so desire on emotional and physical levels and this spiritual development. It's one way. She's familiar to a lot of us. You know, this is not about making the whole world come over to Mother Mary. It's about if Mother Mary resonates for you on some level, go have a conversation with her because she's simply a holographic representation of this great mother. She made her final ascension. She is one with that being. She can be accessed as Isis, as the seven Hathors. You know, she can be accessed as Mother Mary, what have you. Just start tuning into this being. Um having conversations with her to have her show you and and amplify your higher self, which is her, right? So that's what this is about. This is about, again, the angelification of ourselves, the the reawakening. So you can do it through, through any method at all. You can work through simple prayer. You can work through meditation. You can work through the sacred medicines, whatever it might be, going to these big group events, going to William's tours and, you know, and for me, one one very interesting thing I'll just say, my last thing here is that on my on the 
dawn of my birthday, seven, seven recently, I was lying in bed and <laughs> I had drunk too much matcha the night before, and I'm not good with caffeine. So I'm all awake. And, um, and I said, mother Mary, you know, I went into your cathedral, the, the, the Mary queen of the world cathedral in Montreal, which is kind of a replica ish type thing of the church that shall remain unnamed over in, you know, Italy. And uh, I said, why did, I just don't feel it, you know? And she said, I don't dwell in cathedrals. Okay. I love that. I don't dwell in churches. I can be accessed, but that's not where I dwell. Mm -hmm. Where I dwell is in the nature. Where I dwell is in the cave, you know, William, that you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, that Bernadette Subiru, you know, accessed and all these other places. And that brings her into the whole natural fairy world, which is, you know, the last chapter of my book. And the unicorns, that's a whole other topic yeah, you associated with through, you know, the tapestries, talk about weavings, carrying codes and messages. Um, so, you know, she can be accessed for anything you need or want. And you can even graduate from having to access her, right? Once you start gaining the self-mastery, that's what it's all about. She's like, use me and you know, get rid of me um, because I am you, you are me. And that's what we're all trying to show you. Bravo. I am that thou art the, the greatest, the greatest, greatest wisdom. Exactly. Well, exactly. this has been very, very beautiful. I have to turn to the audience momentarily. And if any of you are interested in learning more about uh, this, um, this seminal uh, subject and topic, you can watch um, this talk uh, that William and Margarita did in May uh, below. So there's a, a link below and check that piece out. Uh, it'll take you, dial you up to the next level. Uh, William Henry, Margarita Goglioso, thank you so very much, friends. It's wonderful spending time with you. Pleasure, man. Pleasure. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us both. And and William, I'm always, I, I mean, I Margarita is in heaven right now. All right. These, I consider you the two most amazing men on the planet in terms of this work this revelation this awakening so i'm so honored to be with you both well i'm honored to to be to be hallowed in in, in the company of, of uh, william in that regard and of course with you margarita i spent a, a little time with with william in sedona but not long enough by a long chalk i think we have to do something uh, more sure. together i'm coming on tour in september so i'm going to hunt you down uh, both of you i'll be in canada right. and in uh, north america so i look forward to okay. seeing both you better bring that dog, Dante. That's all I want. Well, he'll be coming with me on tour. Don't That's you worry. Dante. <laughs> God bless, friends. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.